Nobody wants a scarf. Everybody's got no. It's not nobody wants them. Everybody's got them. Yeah. Who doesn't have a scarf? Okay, give those two people a scarf. <laughs> <laughs> just for showing up. Who else doesn't have a scarf either? Yeah. Up. Oh, you need one too. All right. Okay. Here, here. This is the prize for showing up to our talk. All right. <laughs> There's one more. Who was the right. other person? There's two more. Three more. Here. That's it. We're all out of scarves. Oh. Yay. Sorry. Finally. Yeah. Actually, I think I have. Oh, oh. she's got oh. We have stickers too afterwards. We'll give you stickers. Where are the t shirts? Uh, Someone left them upstairs. You left them in the other room. Uh, the other room. Yeah. What other room? Take them. Uh, the the one set room? Two minutes. Okay, Two minutes. Okay. One minute. Let's go. I have a t shirt. We can start without you. Then we'll make them we'll make up funny names for them. Yes. Yeah, what's your name for Jorge? Mexican? Yeah. El Bandito? <laughs> Guys, please take care, take care, Susie. We will start in a minute. I just want to tell you <laughs> a few last things from the organizational part. So this is the last talk. So please enjoy it. Be <laughs> excited, be, and you will, you can see like it will be probably quite a show. So I'm quite looking forward to it. Have you too. Uh, after this, uh, there will be the final competition and the closing at the room upstairs, D105, I believe is the number. So please join us for that as well. And that will be all from my side. So enjoy, have a nice time. She did a great job organizing the whole day. Thank you very much. So we're here um, and you're all here because you just love developer evangelists. And um, we don't need to be mic'd up because most of us can talk pretty dang loud. Um, but first thing I just want to clear up, even though Will Foster just did an awesome session, no monkey suits are required to be a developer evangelist, okay? So today we're going to kind of run this as an ask us anything um, within reason. Okay, so that within reason part, given that who we are, reason. That, that reason is a very small... It's, it's the last... The ex the universe of acceptable questions is quite large. Okay. So first what I'm going to do is going to ask each of us to, um, starting with Ryan on the end, because um, he's the tallest, that's why he's sitting at the end of the stage, so it makes us all kind of look uniform, but we're not. Um, so I ask it, Ryan to tell us what you evangelize about around OpenShift yeah. and a little bit about your background. So I, I'm from Oakland, California, I, which is, uh, a, we consider the capital of the Node.js empire. And uh, I focus on JavaScript and Node uh, as, as my specialty within uh, the OpenShift team. Okay, and... Um, Wait, what other, what other projects did you work on before coming to Red Hat? I think uh, that's actually interesting to the audience. Yeah, I, I actually, um, as, as a, I, I, previously, I worked at uh, Second Life. Has anyone heard of Second Life? Virtual <laughs> World? Okay. I was a, a Linden, uh, Linden Lab employee. And uh, after that, I worked at a company called Eventbrite. Uh, that was, uh, they sell tickets online. And so um, I was their first developer advocate for Eventbrite. So um, if you're interested in being a developer advocate, um, start within your own company. Promote your APIs, what, whatever you have. Um, and uh, th that's how I got my job experience that qualified me to, to join this team. Jorge. What was the question? I just came. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and he really did just come onto the team recently, so yeah. he's not quite our newest one, but tell us a little bit about your background and how you became a developer. He is from Mexico, by the way. Yeah, I'm from Mexico. Down so Mexico is in Europe. South of Europe, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For the Spanish Mexico. Um, I joined the team six months ago, something like that. I've been in Red Hat for three years as a consultant, so I'm bringing real expertise to the team. Oh. 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 I'm more on the enterprise side, so I usually not reach that much with, or at least up, up to now, with developers from external, but more from users, consumers of our, of our products. Okay. And I, 
I don't have uh, any other hobbies or backgrounds or side projects, so I lied in my interview, and I got the job. <laughs> okay, and our Chexican. Chexican, yes. yes. Okay, so I'm local here. Uh, I joined the team. Your name? My name, Mario Kilan. So you'll see by the name that I'm local. Uh, I joined the team. It will be one month, in one month, four years. So I'm four years on the team. Uh, he hired me, I'm not sure why. Uh, I think uh, I was very active in the communities. I was active in open source. I did Rails engineering. I did Rails consultancy, Ruby consultancy, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah. And it's he may get fired if he ever wears a collared shirt again. I don't know what's <laughs> going on. I don't know what's going on with this today. I'm sorry, I had some private business before, so <laughs> I just came here for the session. Uh, so should I say, why do you, what was the well, question? That's good enough. We'll go, we'll go to the next. My specialty will be Rails, probably. Yeah. Okay. And Graham, who is our newest developer advocate, we call them developers. Not chronologically on this earth, but not newest not on this team. On this, yeah. <laughs> the one with the least amount of hair, <coughs> he said. Um, yeah, Graham Dumbleton. Uh, I've actually come all the way from Sydney in Australia, originally. Uh, so, yes, I've been working with Red Hat since July. Although, I, I thought, hell, I've been on, on, been on holidays for so much of that time since <laughs> then. <laughs> um, I came previously from a company called New Relic. Uh, where I was basically doing Python development uh, on their agent for their monitoring system. And after doing program for so many years, I was just sick of it. And I knew some of these guys. I knew what open system was all about. They were big interest in uh, web application deployment Python. And I basically said, I want to work there. And I knocked on their door and kicked it down and got myself in. And, and what was that little project that you worked on? Had to do with whiskey? No, no, no. <laughs> so how many of you have heard of Mod Whiskey in uh, the Apache? Really? That's it? He's the author on Mod Whiskey for Apache, which is probably the most used. Not anymore. Of Not anymore, but for the last <laughs> 10 years? Yeah. Seven. Okay, last seven years was the main way people wrote in Python. All right. All right, so I am Grant Shipley. I have the unfortunate job of managing this group of people that drive me insane and crazy. Um, I started my career as a Java developer at a company called Caldera. Anyone heard of Caldera? Mm -hmm. I was one of the three people responsible for the Linux lawsuits, if you remember <laughs> that. Um, after Caldera, I went to work at a company called Novell where I worked on the SUSE installer. Um, so I wrote part of that for SUSE Enterprise Server. Came to Red Hat as a principal software engineer to convert all the Red Hat's legacy curl code to Java. And then I came over to this new project we were creating called OpenShift and I wanted to try something new so I decided to be the developer evangelist and then we grew and I ended up being the uh, manager somehow. So, yeah. so he's actually been here, you know how? He's been here the longest. I have. <laughs> <laughs> how many years now have you been at Red Hat? Uh, 10, something like that. Like and that then one. he's the oldest member of the event. In terms of team age, he's the oldest <laughs> member on our team. I'm Steve. Uh, who's Steve? Do you want to remember the last name? Uh, my background is I actually have a master's in forestry, a PhD in ecology. And as part of my PhD work, I wrote a lot of simulations and I ran the computer lab for my computer part, my ecology department. I then went to Yale, where I did internal IT projects for Yale, where I would build websites, design databases for faculty members. And so then after that, I got tired of just doing that, and I be became a developer evangelist at ESRI. It's the Microsoft of the GIS world, spatial stuff. And that was about 10 years ago. So I've been a developer evangelist for about 10 years. Um, and I joined this team. I, after that, I was a developer evangelist at Jakarta. Has anybody heard of Jakarta? The LBS company. They, they were just recently acquired by Uber. I left before that, and I'm thankful. And uh, then I worked for LinkedIn for three months, because that'll be an interesting story if anybody wants to know I was a developer evangelist at LinkedIn for only three months. Three months. Three months. Three months. Because once you get those, once the stocks actually get close to vesting, it becomes very hard to quit. <laughs> so I wanted to quit before I got hooked and, uh, and became miserable. And so uh, then I joined Red Hat. I'm a month here a month longer than Mary. Cool, and I'm Diane Hewler. I am uh, the community manager for OpenShift and a developer evangelist. And so my background, I, I'm probably, I'm the oldest on the team and the only woman. Um, we're working on that. 
And I came from a small startup company called Active State. Any of you ever use Active State, Python, Komodo, and all those kinds of things? I was a product manager there and um, did a lot of R&D work. And I was the gal that convinced them to create um, a fork of Cloud Foundry and turn it into Staccato and um, did all of that work. And I worked on that project, the Cloud Foundry, the computing project to, so so I'm from the other side. <laughs> and then I got you know, tired of some of the crap that was going on around in the Cloud Foundry community and um, wanted to go work in a real open source world um, and came over to the red side and started working on OpenShift. <coughs> and I've been here almost three years now doing that and very happily being a lot more open. So the author of some XML I, I worked on uh, an XML standard called XDRL, so all really boring accounting stuff. Um, but it's used globally now in the US, at the SEC, in China, all across Europe. You can blame me for some of the most complex X XML ever written in the entire world and still being written <laughs> for really boring stuff like corporate reporting, um, all kinds of filings and things like that. So I worked on that. I came from a company that was once called Soft Quad. I worked on a project, a product called X Metal. Anybody here know what X Metal is? XML editors, yeah. Um, I did that. That company was acquired by Corel. That was then acquired by another small company called Blast Radius, and uh, acquired by a company in Japan called Just Systems. Um, I've been around, uh, so I was at the same desk the, the entire time. It just changed <laughs> business cards. But um, so I, I did a lot of XML work um, before that, uh, and during some of that, I did a lot of Python. So you'll know me on Twitter as Python DJ, um, and if you're following me, um, I'm sorry. And uh, <laughs> you'll see pictures of my dog and unicorns, and a lot of OpenShift messaging. So that's sort of my background. I, I've been around for a very long time. Um, my very very first job outside of university was at Nike, this the sporting shoe people. I did a lot of CAD CAM work and 3D design. And on the side, I run um, at Get Naked Labs, which is a mobile maker space. And so ask me about that afterwards and I'll be very passionate about teaching kids how to do 3D design. So that's um, what I wanted you all to do. I wanted you to in introduce yourselves. And um, this is Ask Me Anything. I figured I'd feed it um, with a question for our fearless leader. Um, what is the role? Because we always debate this in our class. If you had, we have just been here for a solid week in boot camp, getting training, figuring out our planning for the next year. So we've been drinking a lot of really good beer here in Bruno, but um, we all have different things about what the role is, but we should hear from our Yeah, I think first. so for me, the role is to get developers <coughs> excited about new technology and how they can use it in their projects. Not necessarily, we're not salesmen, we're not uh, marketing, we're actually there to help developers uh, do something, right? And so in order to do that, we actually have to know how to do it ourselves. So a lot of people think of developer evangelists as kind of just talking heads, and that's actually not what we are. Um, we actually go in and, and help developers with code most of the time, you know, just what we do. So I made a video about this. It's called The Feeding of and Husbandry of Developer Evangelists. If you search on this, don't do it now, please. <laughs> and you look on YouTube, that'll be the video where I, I gave my whole entire opinion. I mean, my basic opinion about what we are, our role is, is to be a bridge, right? We're not any one thing, and yet we're pieces of a lot of things. So we are part marketing. This is where I disagree with Grant. We are part marketing. Like, we get up and give talks, and they don't necessarily, sometimes I go to conferences, and I'm giving a talk that is almost purely a marketing talk. It's not gonna be, it still has to have information in it, but it's not necessarily like when Graham gives a talk on Python, Graham sometimes goes so incredibly deep that I could never go. But I am talking to the marketing department, talking about what swag works, right? Do you know, everybody know what swag is? Right, that's swag, right? The scarves are swag. And so sometimes when you see it shows, you can tell when there's a market, developer marketing versus non-developer marketing. How many of you, like let's try to think of what's non-developer marketing swag. No, I like the coffee like cups. You like the coffee <laughs> cups. Yeah, coffee cups works because they're actually really, oh, like the squeezy toys? Do you know those? How many of you pick them up and then almost never use them? Right? Like, like that, that to me is a waste. But if you get actually, I wanted to get Nerf guns. Right? <laughs> That's good developer marketing. Much more interactive. So we're also sales, but not really sales. So we need to talk to the sales people. We're also engineering, 
but not really engineering. So OpenShift engineers, raise your hand. So two, three, yeah? What am I really good at? <laughs> <laughs> you can say it, be honest. Bitching Complaining. Bitching. Bitching. <laughs> so that is my, there's a lot of times we're called advocates and not evangelists. And the reason why is because we go to shows. These guys sit at their desk all the time and just code. We actually go to shows, try to get developers to use the product. We watch them fail. And then we come back and complain at these people the whole time. This is crap. How can we release it like this? We should be, not that OpenShift has any flaws. <laughs> it's perfect. It's perfect because of the complaining we did very early on in the process. <laughs> and then we also meet with PMs as well. So Mike, what else am I really good at? Bitching. Yeah, because <laughs> what our job is with the PMs is to say your roadmap sucks. This isn't helping my users. I'm, we're developers, so we, we bitch about what developers need. If someone wants to bitch about what sysadmin needs, or enterprise customer or enterprise sysadmins need. I don't care. Someone else can do that. I'm on behalf of my users. I'm advocating back into the company. I think that the key <laughs> word was the bridge and the connector because uh, OpenShift, being a platform as a service, touches on a whole swath of communities. And so while we're presenting and trying to connect developers to OpenShift and get them all excited about this and get that feedback, we're also touching on Kubernetes, Docker, OpenStack. So you'll see us show up at OpenStack Summit or KubeCon and other places where, or we did a lot of work with MongoDB on V3. So there, we're all over the map. Um, so we're ne necessarily experts on any one thing. Um, we're, a lot of us are spread a little thin sometimes. So I think it was, it's the feedback loop that's really important that we play to the PMs and the engineering teams, but it's also all that cross-community collaboration. So when OpenStack's about to do something new with Neutron, you know, we get heads up or we try and demo it with Sarah. Um, I don't try to demo it. I hate that stuff. <laughs> but Ryan, like the, the things that we're saying here, just so that you're clear, this is not particularly the OpenShift team. This is what it means to be a developer event. So how many of you like to sit with your head down all the time and write code all day? Okay, you are not going to become a developer event. <laughs> you can't do that. You can be good at that, but you can't do that. Like Ryan, when you were at Eventbrite, you were doing some of the same tasks, right, that we do now. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Uh, getting feedback, I, I was actually within that company, um, part of the marketing team, but organizationally, I was a part of the marketing team for a while uh, because they didn't have anywhere else to, to stick me within the company. Uh, they also, uh, I, I moved over to the product management team for a while. So depending on how your company is structured, um, you may get put within one of these other uh, camps, right? <coughs> but it still should be your duty to advocate for the needs of the developers, the needs of the users, uh, and give that feedback back to the product team. So, so I think we didn't actually answer the question, though, of what we do. <laughs> so, so what do we do? We give conference talks. We write sample applications. We write uh, reference applications for the product. We give trainings, workshops, write blog posts. We have to have an active Twitter following. Uh, we have to be influential in some type of community. Like Steve is pretty well known in the geospatial. I'm pretty well known in mobile, Graham, Python, et cetera, et cetera. And so we, we kind of have to be respected in the communities that we're targeting, right? So like if you asked me to go and talk about Node.js, I wouldn't go, right? I would have Ryan. So we build teams around different uh, interest areas, but that's mainly what we do. Conference talks, blog posts, stuff like that. And so use the product. Essentially, right. you have to be deep in, usually, you have to be deep in two technologies. One is the one that you own, you have, like OpenShift. One is the other one, the community <laughs> that you work with. And then you have to be spread on so many other technologies, be, see what's happening in Python, see what's happening there, see what's happening there, all the emerging technologies, have to look out into the future. But two the technologies always have to, at least two have to be deep. Should be. Yeah. To a certain level. Like, I, there, yo, you want to go? I wanted to interrupt you because. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have to just stand in front of me. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and also, one important thing is that we, we socialize a lot. We need to socialize and listen to the people, to the community that we. So, we like to hang around, we like to go for beers, talk with the developers, because at the end, developers, what they do is the kind of thing. Not they probably don't like to talk with, to the real marketing guys, to the PMs or whatever, because that that kind of engaging with them is really difficult. Hey. We are we are really easy people to <coughs> treat with sometimes like that. If you go with Steve, you will get want to go to the hotel very soon. 
But if you go with people like us, probably you will get. And you can tell who's been on the team longer based on our size <laughs> because of all the uh, time that we spend out talking with you. Yeah. I'm going to actually disagree with Jorge just a little oh. bit because I, <laughs> one, how, <laughs> that's two, that's what I do. But two, if, or how many of you are actually here because you're thinking about wanting to become a developer evangelist? Nobody? Come on. <laughs> then why, so then why are you here? Nice. Now, now that they understand what's required. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like writing code. Um, the, I, the only thing is we're not all extroverts. So Jorge makes it sound like we're extroverts. I'm act, and I seem like an extrovert right now on stage, <laughs> right? Because I talk a lot, and I'm very outgoing, and at the booth, I'm very outgoing. And But when I'm going to go home after this week, oh, oh my gosh, after this week, I'm going to sleep for an entire week. <laughs> and I won't want to meet people, and I won't want to do anything. I'm just going to go on a walk in the wood with my woods with my dog. So I turn it on when I get on stage. And it's not that I'm lying, right? It's not like I turn it on and start lying. But I turn on the persona, and then I turn the persona off when I actually am by myself. And if I keep doing this for two weeks, like this week I'm done. Like last night, Jorge and uh, Ryan wanted to go out drinking. And I was like, no. And I just went back to my room and just watched YouTube videos and laughed a lot. Like that's all I could manage at the end of the week. So don't think you have to be an extrovert to do this. And I hate people all the time. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's true. Totally true. <laughs> and I also hate traveling. So I hate people and I hate traveling. And that's why I got this job. And that's why you're <laughs> And that's actually something else we do a lot, travel. Yeah. Yeah. So the, one of the things that's required with this position, no matter what, is travel. You should like, at least at some level, to travel if you're going to do this. And then, depending on the company, we travel generally less than sales people and SAs, I would say, and consultants, right? But we do tra we travel way more than engineers. I wish engineers would travel more with us because they're actually really good to have in the booth because we get lots of deep technical questions, plus they also get to see direct feedback on their product rather than just hearing it from us. But we travel anywhere between a quarter to almost a half of time, but it's not all year long, it's in bursts usually. Yeah, yeah. in the summer yeah. we travel trip? too. My, longest trip? my longest trip was three and a half weeks, I think. I was on the road. Uh, I worked every day for 20, 28 days once. Okay. My longest trip is probably about two and a half weeks where I was out of country the whole time. Right. And any trip for me is long because I'm so far from being there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. One week. One week. I mean, yeah, probably a week and a half or so. Yeah. yeah. I think I had 32 days with well two days with my dog. Yeah. One time I met my wife <laughs> at the <laughs> airport for lunch when I was flying in and then flew right back out. <laughs> and how many children do you have? I have four kids. All right. Okay. So he's managed to be home a little bit. Not <laughs> 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 more than 10 seconds each trip. <laughs> just deep, just a couple minutes. Just a couple minutes. <laughs> the acceptable boundaries were very, <laughs> very, very. Yeah, yeah. Not, we can go anywhere where you want with the questions. So, um, one of the things we were talking about what questions we were going to ask, and um, what if I don't like public speaking? Can I be still be a developer advocate? And I think, Jorge, you read. I think that you can. Unless you have cojones. Like the Mexican, <laughs> we are Mexican, so, so I am I am Mexican. And I one of the things that um, I he's think not really he's from Spain, <laughs> but I call him the Mexican of the because we're the ugly American. <laughs> I, I, I basically look, look like a Mexican. You speak yeah. Mexican. I speak Mexican. At home, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What was the question? <laughs> it was about speaking. public yes. speaking. It's right above you. I was afraid of public speaking, and still I'm afraid of public speaking. And sometimes you are speaking to the public, and your legs shake. But still, that's something that oh, you want to overcome or not. So if you want to do it, it's just a matter of training and doing it. But still, <coughs> as you see in there, you've been doing this, this for what, 10 years? More than that. I was actually a professor and a, a teaching assistant and all sorts of stuff beforehand. So probably about 17, 18 years I've been public speaking. So that one of the things, Kate, we had a, 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 a Katie Miller, she's now at Facebook, she would come with me and she'd see me speak and it was her first year. And she's like, oh, you're so good. I can never be like you. And I was like, Katie, I could never, she was a fu really great at functional languages. Absolutely. And it was like, as if I sat down and started writing X, Y, I was like, oh, I can't write like Katie, I'm never gonna program, yeah. right? So it's, it's a practice and you just get yeah. good at it and you learn to turn it on and off. And, and a lot of people think, when they see us give a talk, like Steve give a talk, 
that it's the first time he's given that talk. And that's not true. Like we go around to user groups and practice our talks, then we go to larger user groups, and then we submit talks to conferences after we've given it to them 15 times, right? And so when you see a talk that's great at a conference, it's not the first time they have given that talk. I, I think that's a big misconception. Now for me, whenever I go on the stage, I am nervous. I go there, and then there's no time to be nervous. You have to do the talk. Then you go out of the stage, and you're like, hell, was this good or not? And you are nervous again. So this <laughs> 45 <laughs> minutes is the only time that you are not nervous. <laughs> We, well, we did that one. I was just going to say, but now I forgot. Because okay. Mara felt like you needed to talk instead of me. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, oh. Steve. Exactly. There you exactly. go. Exactly. So um, another thing we talk about a lot, we bitch about a lot, I have to say, is how much coding do we do? And what we always complain about is we don't have enough time to really do coding. That's been our, we complain to our manager that we should have a month off so that we could write more sample apps and things like that. Um, and it's probably the most frustrating part of our job is because we're all in tech because we love this stuff, right? And we want to play with the latest Go or Node.js thing. We want to build super awesome demos, but it's really hard to do that when you're in a hotel room at two in the morning and you're trying to get your slides in or a call for papers in or answer 20 million emails. So how much coding do you do these days, Steve? I don't do enough. Actually, that's one of the things that I've, so we can all be really honest here. Do you want, to, do you want us to all be really, really honest here? Because no. I don't know how, yeah, exactly. <laughs> in the, in I have no morals, so honesty means nothing to me. <laughs> Still makes up the time. Yeah. So for me, though, like I, like, I actually, so I'm a New York Jew, right? And so we very, are very emotive, and we like to share and talk amongst each other. I've noticed that when Jorge and I argue, which is not even really arguing, but we're like this. How could you even believe that? <laughs> Merrick is like, Please stop. <laughs> the police are going to come and we're going to get in trouble. They seem like they don't do each other. Right? Exactly. So I, is it, it, would it be really rude to this mostly Czech audience if I actually engage in that kind of discussion? No? Nobody's going to stop. Right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I've actually gone through a period of depression probably for about the last, for a very long time. But for the last three months, I've actually been pretty depressed. We did a very intensive roadshow in the fall and I was burnt out after the end of that. And I haven't written much code, and that's the part that's bumming me out the most right now. Because to be an effective developer evangelist, you actually have to write code. Because I can't go to developers and be like, this is a great experience, or this is a terrible experience, or this is what you usually do with any authority without actually writing code every once in a while. And so when we've been doing a lot of traveling and a lot of speaking and not having, m most of you write code, is that right? Are most of you developers? Yes? Yeah. Thank you. So you know, like you know that you guys talk about interrupting your flow, and that's just somebody coming and knocking on your cube. It's I can't get into a flow state <coughs> ever, basically, and so it becomes very hard to write code. That is what I'm struggling with right now as a developer evangelist, is being able to get back into a period of time where I can be in flow state and write more code. And I, I think in I, I think that part of being an authentic speaker, you need to have experience, and you want to. Uh, Anyone telling me what to do, I just get to make that stuff and then work on whatever I want. 
Well, that's not it. It has to be somewhat related to what, like, when when I'm work when I was working at LinkedIn, I needed to work on a LinkedIn sample app. When I'm working on OpenShift, I can't sit there and go, oh, I'm going to write an app that does nothing to do with OpenShift. Yeah, that's it's got to use OpenShift in some way, which really? is very broad. Yeah, no one told me that. <laughs> <laughs> that's why you still like your job so much. Yeah, yeah. Mm, yeah. We'll meet after this. <laughs> so I think all of us have like little sample apps that we keep iterating on and playing with, and I've got a musical jukebox thing with SoundCloud that I've been working on and trying to get into OpenShift 3, and, and it is, it's, it's frustrating because you want the back end to run there, and then, and then someone comes out with another great Red Hat mobile, and the Feed Henry guys have this amazing, you know, iPhone app development environment, and you want to play with that too, and you get distracted because it's like a kid in a candy box at Red Hat. There's just so much stuff, and then the call for papers comes for OpenStack Summit. No, oh God, I got to try and deploy OpenShift on OpenStack again. It's it's endless what you get to play with, but it's endless too. So um, it's a little bit of how deep can you go down the wormhole thing? You know, that's really. So how many, m most, no one raised their hand when they said they wanted to be a developer. Maybe one person raised their There's hand. Somebody in the back. Yeah, one person said, the two people maybe. What are the rest of you here for? <laughs> I mean, I'm <laughs> serious, because I want to know, like, we can just sit up here in their t-shirts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but most of you are, he what are you here for? I, no, I didn't raise my hand because you need to want Avenger and not Edmonton. Okay, uh, so who wants uh, to be a, right, that's a, this is a big debate in our community about what's the proper term. Yes. I think it's just words. We both do the same job, but some people get, I know, some people find it offensive and. No, I think there's different things. It's more about inside out or outside mm -hmm. approach. Uh, no, because I've, I've never no. seen a company where they have both. Yeah. They, you, the company usually has developer evangelists, so they have developer advocates, not both. So there's not a dual role. It's just how they, like, it's Google didn't like the evangelical like the Christian implications of evangelists, so they went with advocate. Before that, it was always developer evangelist. But I love telling people on the airplane that I'm an evangelist. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Especially with his southern accent. Start with conversations <laughs> after that. Yes, I will have four more Jack Daniels and Coke. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so who here wants to be a developer evangelist, developer advocate? A few? We're so getting more. There's more now. Yeah. There's more. It's getting better. All right. It's getting better. So Good news. We're hiring an APAC. Yeah. <laughs> there was only one APAC guy here. I got him yeah. taped in the morning. So the other thing about this, about how much coding do you do, and I think um, Diane touched on this, is that one of the things that you do need to be as a developer advocate slash evangelist is curious. Right? You are somebody. I know developers in general are, like to chase after shiny objects, but you tend to have more of that because you're com a bit more comfortable being an inch thick and a mile deep, and a mile deep on only one or two things, right? So you have to be comfortable and looking and like, oh, what's the new thing I can play with? Or that's how you learn the new technology. Well, I, I put this one. I stuck this next question in. But are there any questions in the audience? If anybody got one, because we only have ten minutes left. Ten minutes left. Okay. There yeah, you go. Go. go for it. There you go. I was curious. You said that you were both a community developer and a developer advocate. What is that duality like? Oh, it's a lot of. There's, it's a lot of fun, actually. Um, I, so I, I still get to do all the developer evangelists, do the calls for papers, go out there and advocate for people to use OpenShift. But I also have a role in, in this specific business unit of being the person, the community manager, who, who connects with all the other open source projects that we upstream in. So I get to sit on Kubernetes management, community management calls. I get to go to OpenStack and try and connect with all the people there and coerce people into doing heat templates for me. Um, and I just basically have to do all of that, plus um, doing the recruitment and trying to get people to contribute code back. Um, I run the OpenShift Commons, which is our community uh, hub, so trying to get organizations and everybody. So and how many companies do we have in it? We have now 177 companies in it. We have 35 companies that have organizations that have contributed code to OpenShift, and so the Commons model is a little slightly different. Um, so basically, I do two jobs, Grant. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Grant. You, you need a couple more to stay busy. Not really. <laughs> so I remember the thing I wanted to say, and it's related to what Grant said, all the things that we do. We all do those, but we don't all do them all equally well. So when he went through that list, don't think, like public speaking, Grant hates it and doesn't want to do it as much anymore, right? But he'll have to do a little. It, you can do a mixture, but you're, you'll have to do all those tasks you don't have to do them all equally well. Mm -hmm. That's all, okay? Some, like, Graham loves writing blog posts, thank goodness. I hate writing, so 
So we'll be doing both of those tasks, but Graham will do more writing and I'll do more speaking. And I'll trade uh, one going to one conference for Grant writing a blog post. So you'll see us swap back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> if he'll write that blog post, I'll do that speaking at that conference until he gets to stay home. Yes. How do you how do you follow up with the people you meet? Who do you meet? <laughs> so the way I follow up with the people I meet is I say you email me, otherwise I'm never going to email you. <laughs> it, I mean, it's, it's really hard. It, that's the hardest part for me is. You meet people because you're giving talks and they come up and talk to you and then you see them two years later and they come up like you remember everything yeah. about the conversation <laughs> and you don't. And that, that's what makes me feel the worst, right? Um, because there's just no way. We meet thousands and thousands of people a year and actually have like five, ten minute conversations with them, but we don't remember. Or I don't anyway. I stopped <laughs> taking cars. I don't take them anymore. And they say, oh, well, I'd really like to do blah, blah, can you do blah, blah, blah. I was like, okay, here's my card. If you're really interested enough, you'll contact, I would say contact me. And if they never contact me, which 99% of the people never do, then I'm off the hook. I'm not, I don't want that on my soul to have to not contact them. So, so I have a slightly different opinion of that <laughs> because as a community manager, I have to try and connect you and get you ins inspired to work on our project or work with our project or do something with us. So I tend to be the one that does take your card and you will get an email back from me. Um, you join the commons, you can get into on our mailing list, uh, try and coerce you into giving a briefing or becoming what we called before an accelerator, which is basically um, an external evangelist for OpenShift. So um, there's lots of different ways we all work with the external community. But yes, uh, probably half of you will come up to me in a conference and next time I'm in Bruno, and I'm really good at making that face. It's like, oh yeah, I know who you are. <laughs> I, I think one of the weirdest moments in my life, I'd been doing this for a year, and I was at Java One or some conference, and somebody came up to me and was like, oh, I, fi I finally get to meet you in person. I've always wanted to meet you. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about, dude? <laughs> and I called my wife and told her I was famous, right? But <laughs> you know, people read our blog posts and stuff, and it's kind of a weird feeling when you first get into it. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So, yeah, there was another question here. Uh, thank you. Uh, the question is, how do you meet with the candidates? So because it's a big topic now. Do you uh, meet with the developers, let's say, or like, I mean, you work with project managers, but some people uh, have problems with the space or whatever. Do you do anything for those people? Or is it just He can't do it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he always talks loud. What? What? Oh, oh, I didn't hear what the question was, sorry. <laughs> yeah, basically, you have different mentalities as, as well below, and diversity. Oh, yeah. 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 Or do you? I actually, I do. So, like, I've talked a lot in Asia. I do. So we let him go there. Yeah. I and Asia is very. I'm. I actually will tend to speak more like this when I go to Asia, because their English is not as good, but it's way better than my ability to speak Chinese or Malaysian. <laughs> so I actually I will. But it took me years to get that cadence down, and I'll do it sometimes. You guys all speak English relatively well, but if I go to another European country when I know it's mostly non-English speakers, I'll slow down as well. So yeah. It also helps to teach kids, right? Like I do, I do coding events with kids on the weekends too, and there you also learn to change your cadence. You just have to get, it's practice. The same way like, oh, I'm in a functional language, now I'm in SQL, now I'm in a procedural language, right? You need different mindsets, it's the same skill just like that. But the problem is that sometimes you don't know so you go the first time to somewhere, so you don't know uh, what what's their habits. So I've been, for example, in my country, in, in Nordic country, where I didn't know that they have like this uh, sense of privacy. So I would, I'm from <laughs> school, <laughs> <and> I, really <laughs> <laughs> I like to talk with the guys, so I'm going out, having some beers, and I couldn't. But I tried for the first week until somebody told me, don't do this, you are invading this, this private space. So sometimes you don't know, and you don't really feel that. Uh, when we first started OpenShift, we, our job was to get developers using the platform, and so we did measure it then, um, but once we got to like 500,000, we stopped, right? So we don't measure that as effectiveness as our team. The way we're measured now is based on the amount of content that we create and the survey forms that you guys fill out at conferences to let us know if the talk was good or not. 
but to have a good conference hall, not just the technical information, like people want to be entertained, right? Even at a conference, like they like talks that entertain them because they don't remember anything you say except for one or two things. But they'll remember that it was a good talk on that guy worked at Red Hat. I was just checking out. So before we, um, and I want Lucy to stand up. Lucy is our HR hiring person here. And um, so you can check in with her. She's our, she's our advocate. I will leave some cards uh, here on the desk that are not my cards because I will deliver all of them. But uh, for my own use, so you can just uh, uh, privately you can just send it to me and you will get my number back to you. Just give me credit or There's also a Dev Evangelist Manifesto that we wrote. It was actually came out of our document as a team that I then put up in a Git. It's, a Git, it's an ASCII doc up in, I forget, is it in our GitHub repo or my GitHub repo? It's a manifesto that talks through a lot of the things we did. Like this was not enough time to talk through a lot of stuff. Like what's a good company to work for? What are good interview questions? What's your roles? What should you expect? What should you be expecting to produce? We didn't talk, we just barely touched the surface of yeah. being a developer. It's a relatively new field too. And so you get into a lot of confusions in a lot of different companies about what's a good developer evangelist? What's their role? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but that's also a big benefit, right? Because a lot of companies are starting to hire this position, which makes it a very sought after uh, position. Like we honestly get job offers at least once a week, I would say. Yeah, that's a bad week. Yeah. Unless you live in Australia, <laughs> no, that contract is off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Actually, but we live in North America, so that, I mean, I'm, and I'm in the Bay Area. And Ryan, so probably Ryan and I, myself, probably get the most because we're already there. Like yeah. every startup now wants Yeah, I'm in Vancou one. Vancouver, BC, and it's like, you know, LinkedIn, I hate because you just, <laughs> it's like, I'm sorry, I don't live here. <laughs> you won't get paid as much as an engineer, maybe. Certainly in the beginning. Mm -hmm. If you're worried about compensation, in the beginning, depending on the company, they will not see you as valuable as an engineer. Those are, those are some of the things you need to suss out and figure out when you're interviewing, too, is to really ask them. I'm out of time. Is there any <laughs> sessions after this, though, in this There's room? no sessions after yeah, there's, there's one upstairs. Thing. I think oh, the yeah. prize thing is now? Oh, okay. Yeah. What's more important, us or prizes? <laughs> 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 we have, we yeah, have yeah, plenty, we've got plenty of t-shirts right. and scarves still. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> t-shirts and have stickers as well. No monkey suits <laughs> required, but they're optional. <laughs>
like good weather year round. Pero bueno, es, es cuestión de, de que un día veas la oportunidad. Pues, yo nunca, nunca había pensado entrar en este equipo y de repente un día en una charla alguien dijo, está la posición abierta y dices, joder, ¿y por qué no? Sí, tío, pero al final, yo, si te lo vas a pensar, yo tengo más características. Sí, claro, yo viajaba. Tú tenías una vida muy triste, creo, porque te ibas a, te ibas a viajar por... por